Well, welcome. Thank you for being here today. What kind of computer is that? That's a question that I've frequently heard over the last three years that I've had this type of PC. And because of this, I've been thinking about for some time about actually giving a seminar on tablet PCs, how to use them. But just recently, I found out about Windows Vista, the newest version of Windows operating system, which will be released in uh, January 2007, or at least that's what Microsoft says this time. And um, Windows Vista is going to have tablet PC capabilities built inside of it already. So what I anticipate, and I could be wrong, but what I anticipate is that tablet PCs might become a lot more prevalent around because you'll have the operating system on your computer to operate on. Okay, let's begin with some basics. First of all, this is a tablet PC, obviously. Uh, this is the computer that's down here in the Harden 49 lab. Um, and you can see that it looks just like a regular old laptop. Where the difference starts is this little hinge right here on the computer. Because if I gently push on it, now the screen can rotate 180 degrees. If I put it down, there's a locking mechanism here that keeps it in place. And now I can use it in tablet mode. Now I'm going to switch over to this document camera so you can see what I'm doing. Okay, this docu document camera was uh, totally installed at 2.30 today. <laughs> so thank you to ITG for getting this installed. There we go. So for the first about five or ten minutes, I'm just going to show you from this angle what I'm doing with my tablet PC so you can get a general idea of how I'm interacting with it with my pen. First of all, if you notice here, we have some buttons, and I guess I can zoom in as well. I have some buttons. So for example, there's this button right here that allows the screen orientation to switch from portrait to landscape, landscape back to portrait. It's a very useful tool. Oops, let's keep on going all the way around. There we go. Also, I have up and down arrows as well. And I have a, a function key here that in combination with some of those buttons, I can do various other tasks as well. Let me zoom out. Okay. Now, in order to actually interact with the tablet PC, you need to use the pen. And the pen for this particular tablet PC is located right in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, other tablet PCs might actually be located in other places as well. So, let me take out my pen and let me actually put it on the tablet and zoom in again. So, let's, let me point out a few things. First of all, you notice here I have uh, a white tip to it. And actually, the, the, the resolution here is a little bit worse than it is here, so I apologize. Um, you should be able to see like a little white tip. You, know, you can kind of see it. Um, that's where the digital ink comes out of. This is just like your regular old tip of a pen. On the other side of it, you have an eraser. and It's kind of hard to see up there, but the eraser is actually um, gray in color, and it's kind of squishy like a regular old pencil eraser. That's how you can erase stuff. One way. Also, if you notice, let's see, right there, you see like a little button? That uh, is allows you to do the equivalent of a right click on a mouse. There are other ways to do a right click as well, and I'll show you those in about a minute. Um, and to be honest, I don't use that particular method. Okay, so I'm going to take up my take up my pen, and I'm just going to drag it across the screen here. And you can see how my mouse arrow, you could say, is following my pen. But I'm not even touching the screen at all. I'm not touching the screen. Let me zoom out a little bit too here. Now, there's a software package I'm going to show you called Windows Journal. And similar to how you would use a mouse, I'm going to move my arrow over to Windows Journal, and I'm just going to tap, double tap it, and open it up. So a double tap on your screen with your, with your digital pen is equivalent to a left click of a mouse. I'm sorry, a tap on the screen is, is equivalent to one left click of a mouse. Okay, 
So let me zoom out a little bit more. Sorry to keep on zooming in and out here. Um, if you notice, uh, I'm going to use the minimize button up here that you normally see with a computer to minimize. I just simply tap on it. And now I'm back to my desktop. Suppose I tap and hold. Look what happens. A little mouse appears that, and the right mouse button is actually being shown. That's how you can do a right mouse click. That's another way in addition to this little button right here. So let me go ahead, tap and hold, release, and now my right mouse button little menu bar or menu came up. So that's how you can do a right mouse. Let me go ahead and open up Windows Journal again. And we can zoom in some more too. I can use this pen in Windows Journal like if, like interacting with a, a pen and a piece of paper. So if I come over here to my, oops, there we go. There is a little, sorry, my head gets in the way. Uh, there's a little pen icon there. It's a little bit tough to see, but I'll show it to you on my computer over here. And if I just simply tap on it, now I can simply write in my document, just how I would normally with a piece of paper and a pen. Um, so also I can just you know, do some squiggles as well. And that's what I'm doing here is using what's called digital ink. At least that's what some people call it. Um, I can go ahead and tap up here, bring down a little menu that allows me to change, let's say, the thickness and the color of what I'm writing. And now I can write go big red. Now when I'm writing, I'm actually touching the screen with my pen. That's the key. I'm touching the screen with my pen. It's the only way that digital ink can come out. Well, I could also highlight. Here's the highlighter. And I can just simply highlight like that. How about erasing? Well, I can tap on the eraser to do one way of erasing. And suppose I select the stroke option. Can you see that? Suppose I select the stroke option for erasing. What will happen is, is that my pen will erase one pen stroke at a time as I'm moving it across the screen. First of all, notice how my icon has changed to an eraser. And as I'm, oh, let's see that. As I'm moving it across the screen, look how it's doing one pen stroke at a time. Alternatively, I could change it to maybe, let's say, the medium selection for erasing. And now it's just going to erase, as you can see here, a little square. It's just going to erase a square, similar to if you were to use a pencil and you actually erase it that way. Now what happens if I did turn over my pen and use the little squishy part on the end of it? Well, that's another way that you can erase. So this, uh, this stroke option for erasing, it can be very useful. So for example, I had this big squiggly in the middle of my screen. I can simply do that because that was one pen stroke. I was able to erase all of it at once. Let me go ahead and minimize that. That's only one software package that you can use it with. There I will be showing others. So uh, Windows Journal is probably one of the first that you could use it with. And I don't use Windows Journal too much anymore. Um, but it's a nice basic one to start off with. Um, now the actual operating system on this tablet PC is Windows XP Tablet PC Edition. So it's not just Windows XP itself. It's the Tablet PC Edition of Windows XP. And with it you get some additional options that you can work with. So for example, I have down here my control panel open. And let me zoom in. And you can see that there's an additional option called uh, Tablet and Pen Settings. So if I just tap on that, let me try it again, double tap on that, you see a little menu or window pop up that will allow you to do a variety of different options. Um, dealing with the pen, dealing with your computer. The main one that I want to show you is this one down here which says Calibrate. Before you start using a tablet PC, you should calibrate it to if you're using your right hand or if you're using your left hand with the tablet PC and calibrate it to the angle at which your hand is actually touching the screen. If you do that, you'll get a lot better recognition of the pen 
with the computer. So for example, if I tap on Calibrate, it will take me through a number of steps where all I need to do is just tap in the middle of these squares. Move up. Sorry, that's going in and out blurry. And now my pen has been calibrated with my computer. The number one problem that beginners have with a tablet PC is they don't do that calibration first. What can happen is, is if I put my pen on, 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 my, on the computer again, what can happen is that that arrow button that you see might be farther over to the left or farther or over to the right, and it won't match up with where you're putting the tip of the pen. So it's always important to calibrate. Okay, let me switch now back to my laptop. Okay, there's a variety of software packages that you can use a tablet PC with. Let me, let me turn this off. Oops. There we go. There's a variety of software packages that you can use a tablet PC with. I'm just going to show you a few of them today. The first one is Word. So let me escape out of this. And I have this test document, which is a Word document set up so that we can uh, interact with it. Um, and for those of you who over are over here, unfortunately the, this projector is cutting off the left hand side of the screen. You notice over there it's capturing it all and I'll, I will try to um, adjust for that. So I'm going to take out my pen and I'm going to, with, um, with a tablet PC, you get a few additional toolbars that you wouldn't normally get with a um, with a regular old uh, laptop. There's one called Ink Annotations, Ink Comment, and Ink Drawing and Writing. I'm going to show you just this Ink Annotations toolbar. So let me drag it out. There's my Ink Annotations toolbar. Um, if I want to start writing in my Word document, all I need to do is simply tap on the pen and I can write out, try it again, go big red. If I want to, I can let's say change the pen color to let's say blue. I can change the thickness of the line to, oh let's do three, three point, and let's do go big red again. So I can actually write anywhere that I want to inside my Word document. If I want to erase, I can tap on the eraser, that would be one way, and it will erase one pen stroke at a time. Alternatively, I can turn around the pen and erase that way. If I want to stop writing, or what, um, what Microsoft likes to call inking, I can tap on stop inking, or tap on the little arrow key. Now I can start typing in my document like I normally would. So again, I can type go big red. Let me move this out of the way. Well, what if, though, you want to actually type in your document without using the keyboard? I'll give you an example where that can be useful coming up, but believe me for now, this, there may be an example where this happens. Well, I'm going to take my pen and I'm going to go into my Word document. And notice that little a uh, keyboard with a pen that appears. So I take it off, put it back on. Well, let me go down there, tap on that, and up will pop up what's called the Tablet PC Input Panel. So if I wanted to, I can operate this just like a regular old uh, keyboard and tap out Go Big Red. Excuse me? other than just this right here you see? Yes. Yes. So for example, I can go over here to writing pad and I can write go big red. And notice the handwriting recognition that appears as well. It's not perfect, but it does a pretty good job. Suppose I come over here to the character pad. And this can be useful if you know you if you just want to do one character at a time. Okay, let's try that again. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, like a European or... 
I don't know. I don't know. But that, that would be that would be interesting if that is available or not. So let me try this again. And I can fortunately, of course, my computer's not working right now. Yeah. Trust me, there's a character pad that you can do this as well. Let me do that. Okay. Let me make sure I talked about everything that I wanted to. Um, let's say that you want this uh, tablet PC input panel to be open at all times. One way to do that is if you can, you can go down here to the little icon at the bottom of the screen, which is the same icon that we saw above, and I can open it up, and now it will always be open, no matter what. Um, so, where would this be useful if you want to you know, use your pen to actually type out stuff. Well, one place I have found it useful is on an airplane. I don't have enough room to get my keyboard out and start typing on the airplane and actually see my monitor. So instead, what I've often done is I get my tablet PC input panel out and I type out a test, I type out a project, I type out whatever I want to, but I just use my pen. And I use my tablet PC in this mode like this. Yeah, well, for example, a Palm, uh, for, I used to have a Palm PDA before I, I had this, and, you know, you had this graffiti uh, where, you know, if you do a certain pen stroke, it recognizes it as like an R. You don't have that. Just do an R, and it recognizes it. Um, not perfect. I admit it is not perfect, but it does a pretty good job. So let me close this out. And let's actually look at some examples of where I've actually used a tablet PC with a Word document. Okay. Sorry, my computer right now is running a little bit slow because I'm actually recording this seminar here, and I'll explain more about recording in a little bit. Um, so, this uh, was from uh, Friday, August 19, 2005. This was the, uh, the uh, faculty meeting agenda that Walt Stroop distributed to all faculty. He distributed just the type part in a Word document. Well, I downloaded, I put it on my computer, and during the actual faculty meeting, I wrote in red notes throughout. And notice where these notes correspond to. They correspond to, you know, where we are in the particular meeting agenda. Uh, for example, down here, something that was very important for the, for the graduate committee to consider, about moving time of comp exam. So I highlighted that saying, ooh, grad studies committee needs to take care of that. I'm just going to page down a little bit so you can see this, and you know you can write as much as you want um, uh, throughout. Now this is a very very simple example, but I think it helps demonstrate something that's very important um, with tablet PCs, is that they can really help you organize your work. Because now, after I uh, was at that faculty meeting, I saved the document and I put it in a folder on my computer, so that show you the actual place. I have a folder called Chris, UNL, I have uh, faculty meetings, I have 2005 and 6. So those contain all the agendas, all my notes that I took during faculty meetings for this particular school year. A tablet PC is organizing my work file. I no longer have to deal with a piece of paper that has the agenda on it, it has my notes, and just throw it in my office and maybe lose it forever or file it away in a filing cabinet and forget about it. Here, where, whenever I have my computer with me, I have my filing cabinet with me. Yes? Well, if there's ever a memory lapse, maybe it's just a I can go back, yes. I can go back. What size are those files? It's, it's not that bad in terms of f additional file size. And actually, let me, let me show you something I, I forgot to earlier. Okay, this image here 
is actually, um, or, or this writing here is basically like an image in a Word document, like a picture, for example. So if I mouse over it, right click, I can format it, just like how you would with, with a regular old picture. And, for example, if I want to, let's say, change the color for some reason to purple, don't know why you would want to do that, but you could. Um, change the thickness, there we go. Also, I could format layout. Notice what's selected there in front of text. My ink is always by default going to be in front of text. You know, like if you were to insert a picture into a Word document, you would have that far left-hand side one in line with text, or an equation you would have in line with text. But this in front of text is actually what you want when you're dealing with a uh, when you're dealing with inking and stuff. Close that. Here's another example of where I've used Word in a tablet PC. These are my lecture, these are, these come from my lecture notes. Um, this was for STAT 870, a regression analysis course. And for those of you who don't know, all my lecture notes are typed up in Word documents that students can download from my course website. And, um, I don't know why that's not showing oh well. And what I am showing you here is after I interact with this in class, what it looks like. So this is after I've actually added content to my lecture as we are going through page by page my lecture. This is what it looks like. So some simple examples. Here we're dealing with a, regression, a simple linear regression model. And to begin with, I'm just simply using my pen as basically a laser pointer. So I'm circling stuff, I'm highlighting stuff throughout. Then we come over here to that. I ask my class an interactive question about what is a sampling distribution? What does a sampling distribution mean? So to help them out, we drew out a histogram, we put a nice little normal distribution overlay on it, and I was able to put it in a picture. How about for proofs? Here's a proof of proving that the B1, the sample um, regression model slope, is unbiased. Now you look at that and you can think, well, geez, that's, that's kind of messy. But you have to remember how students are seeing this. They're seeing this step by step by step in the proof. They don't see all this ink at once. They see it step by step by step. So for example, here, Step one of my proof, and I'm going to use my mouse to actually point to it. Step one of my proof, I had it previously typed out, and to get to step two, what did I do? Well, I brought this summation inside the brackets. To go from step two to step three, I bring the Y bar outside the summation. In step three, I also add content for my students, where I tell them, well, the sum of the xi minus x bar, what does that actually mean? So I added down here some additional content. Let me keep on going. I was easily over here able to show students what a 1 minus alpha divided by 2 quantile from a t distribution actually looks like inside my lecture notes. And keep on going. Okay. Probably the number one benefit of using a tablet PC with Word for a statistics course is that you can annotate output so easily. You know, so often we have this computer output and we need to show students where to find certain items and stuff. Well, tablet PC provides a great way to do that. So here's some R output where we're fitting a simple linear regression model. And as I page down, I ask my students interactively, well, what is that estimated regression model? based upon what they told me, I wrote it out down below. Also, this p-value is very important. It tells you how the, the independent variable, if it's significantly related with the dependent variable. So I was able to circle that. If I come up here, I was able to circle, circle what residual standard error is. And what does it mean in, in the context of our particular book? Well, it's the square root of MSE. Also, add some content over here explaining what the curve function does, for example, uh, in R. So, that's a quick example of how one can use that with your lecture notes. 
If you wanted to then, you could save this document, upload it to your course website, and students can download it with this additional content in it. I actually do not do that. <laughs> well, I'm hoping that you're actually taking notes in class too. So, uh, let's see now. Yes, yes, and you will see that shortly. Thank you for uh, foreshadowing. Okay, so I grade all projects, homework assignments that my students turn in. I grade them electronically. I require the students to do to turn in a Word document so I can grade it in Word. Uh, you could also do this with PowerPoint. I'm sorry, with a PDF as well. You just will have to convert the file. Um, I, I I can sh show you how to do that uh, after the seminar if you're interested. But why, why consider grading electronically versus the old-fashioned, you got a piece of paper and you're going to grade that? Well, there's a number of reasons. Obviously, cuts down on paper. Save a tree. Two, makes your grading a lot more portable. I don't need to carry around a stack of papers with me, like for example on an airplane. All I need is my laptop. All my grading that I need to do is right there. Three, students can get quicker feedback from me. Because once I have it graded, I can email it to them. I don't, they don't have to wait till the next class to actually receive their grade. Hopefully then, the students will take a look at their grade beforehand, see what they did wrong, then they can come prepared to the next class to answer, to ask questions. And finally, it's also great for erasing and rewriting. For example, suppose I put minus five next to a particular problem on a project. And then later I think, you know, that student really deserved minus 10. <laughs> I wouldn't really do that, though. Okay? But you, what would you have to do if you had a piece of paper? Well, you would have to cross out that minus 5 enough so that the students don't actually see that you have minus 5 there to begin with. <laughs> well, with a tablet PC, just erase it. And they'll never know. Okay. What's that? Uh, you, I don't know if you could track that. I mean, you can track various changes that you make to a Word document, but I don't know about that. that that's a good question. Um, so here's a project from Stat 380, Fall 2005, project number four. I, of course, deleted the names. Uh, not that the students are here. Uh, the student got 36 out of 40 points. They did some extra credits. So that's why they got the plus three there. Let me just page down a little bit. And one of the main parts of the project itself, and I guess I can make this a little bit bigger, one of the main parts was to find a confidence interval for the difference of two proportions. And they found the Agresti and Kaffel confidence interval for that purpose. And at the beginning, they're finding these adjusted proportions correctly. They're finding the value from the standard normal correctly. They even write out the formula correctly. Then comes their fatal error. P1 and P2 are the population proportions. Well, for some reason, they think they're also equal to the sample proportions, too. Oh, well, that happens sometimes. But, of course, I have to take off two points for that. Uh, part D, provide an interpretation of this confidence interval in terms of the problem. Well, they didn't get that quite right, so I just simply um, line, uh, drew a line through the stuff that they didn't quite do right. And I was actually wrote in there what the correct interpretation is. So that's a quick example, grading example. What do you mean by a format change? Uh, no. Yeah, I mean, it's basically exactly the same. The, the word is exactly the same. I, I'm just using the Office XP CD when I'm installing it. It's just with the Windows XP Tablet PC Edition, you're going to get some additional toolbars that you can work with. Yes? Well, I remember, like, last semester, when you would always get our project back to grade one, that all your comments would be, like, two inches or above or below where they're supposed to be. Like, you would circle something that would be, like, not, there was nothing there. I mean, like, if we had to, like, figure out, okay. Um, but it was, it was all, every single project was like that. Now, what version of Word were you using? Well, I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm surprised. I'd be interested in actually seeing that, because that, that, yeah, that shouldn't happen. Oh, 
<laughs> well, well, have any of my other students experienced that? <laughs> well, were you in the same group, though? Okay. Well, you need to tell me that. <laughs> Sorry, I, I apologize that that happened, but you know I'd be interested in seeing it so I can learn you know exactly what's going on. So please, please talk to me sometime after this. Yes. So, say you're written on there, and then they want to type something else above. Would the pen stuff be down if you entered, or would it? It it. There, there we go. My, my computer's just running slow, so that's why that happened. It should stay where it is. Okay, so that's Word. Let me close this out. Let me close the whole thing out. Yeah. When you add all your writing stuff, does that, how big do the files get? They, they really don't become any too many bigger, too much bigger. Um, it, it, it's not really noticeable. It's not noticeable. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, just a 40 gigabyte. I'm sorry, 30 gigabyte. Um, so let's talk about how you can use PowerPoint with a tablet PC. Uh, now, over here we see an ink annotations toolbar just like what we saw in Word. So you could write in your PowerPoint document just like how I was writing in a Word document. Let me go ahead and dock that again. Um, but there's something else that's really good for a tablet PC and interacting with PowerPoint. So here's a seminar that I gave to the Department of Statistics at the University of South Carolina about a year ago. Um, First of all, if I want to, let's say, advance to the next slide, well, how would you normally do that? Well, with the mouse, you would left click. Again, remember, by just tapping, that's equivalent to a left click. So there we go. I'm going to the next slide, and I'm going to the next slide. Okay. <laughs> now, suppose, suppose you got to a point here where you want to actually point to something with your laser pointer. Now, I'm not trying to ignore you behind me, but you can see I'm kind of kind of ignoring you, actually. Or if I go over here, I'm ignoring now this side over here. Well, what would be a solution? Well, one thing you could do is take two laser pointers and point to the particular cow like that. Of course, that's kind of difficult to do. Alternatively, use the fact that we have a tablet PC down here. So let me come down here. Oops, let me actually go back. Okay, so I can come down to my pen, and let's say I just pull out a ballpoint pen, and suppose I want to circle this cow for some reason, or maybe this cow, and all I'm doing is using my pen as a laser pointer. And the added benefit is the fact that both people, or both sides, can actually see it simultaneously. You know, maybe I want to emphasize the steam that's rising here, for example. Now let's say I want to go to the next slide, or the next animation. How would I do that? Well, I told you, all you have to do is tap. But look what happens. It thinks I'm still inking. So what could you do? Well, you can come down to this arrow and go to the next one like that. Or you can simply turn off um, actual the, the actual inking. So I can go back to my arrow, and now I can just tap on my screen. Like that. So that's PowerPoint. And corresponding to, I think, a question earlier, it asks you, well, do you want to keep or discard these marks that you've made? Uh, you know, usually I just discard and let me exit out of it. Did you say keep? Did you need the option just to say it is a different file? Uh, well, you could keep it, but until you save your file, it's not going to be you know, saved with the file. So you could save it in the normal way. Um, let's take a look at OneNote. OneNote is probably, I think, the best software package to use with a tablet PC. Uh, students and faculty can get it for $11 from the UNL Computer Store. It's actually part of the Office XP family, but it's not, you know, when you buy Office XP, you know, you just usually get the standard Word, PowerPoint, you know, depending upon the actual uh, version of Office XP that you're getting. And 
to help explain this, what OneNote does, think of a filing cabinet. Inside of filing cabinets, you have usually vanilla folders. At the top of the manila folder, you're going to have some kind of label to let you know what is it. Well, seminar is 0607. I can open up my manila folder, and inside I'll have pieces of paper. So for example, maybe this is are the, the notes I took for the first seminar this semester. These are the notes for the second seminar this semester. <laughs> well, I actually use my tablet PC. Um, so, how does OneNote work? Well, what you see above here, I'm going to use my, my mouse to point to it. What you see above is basically the contents of your filing cabinet. So, if I come over here to Seminars 0607, you can see my actual notes that I took during the first seminar, during the second seminar, and during, during the third seminar, and so on. So, for example, for Dong seminar that we had earlier this semester, I just simply copied and pasted the title and abstract into my OneNote document here, and the stuff in red are my actual notes that I took during that seminar. So let me page down, and you get to some point where you start seeing I'm doing stuff in blue now. Well, that corresponds to now questions that I have for Dong that I might ask at the end of the seminar. So I'm using different colors to highlight certain things. So for example, I had a question about how he was doing some of his bootstrapping. Well, let's go over here now to the Tablet PC seminar, um, what's called a section in OneNote's terminology, equivalent to a manila folder. I have this blank page set up so I can interact with it. And again, if you notice on the, oh, you can't see it over there, let me pull this out. Oops, let's try it over here. There we go. I have this drawing and writing tool. So I no longer have the ink annotations toolbar anymore. Instead I have this drawing and writing tools. And I can simply tap on the pen. And now I can write Go Big Red. I can change the color. I can change the size of the, 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 the ink. I can also, um, let me actually write out one more here. I can also erase. I can also just insert text. So suppose I tap on that. And now I can type Go Big Red. Now notice here, you see some gray bars. Well, the way that OneNote actually organizes this in is what it's called paragraphs. So for example, this is one paragraph. And I can move that to wherever I want to on my screen. How often when you're actually writing something on a piece of paper, where you write something on the first line, then you write something on the second line, how often does it occur to you that you actually want to put now something in between? A lot. Now, how can we do this with OneNote? Well, come to the Insert Extra Writing Space toolbar, and let's do that. And now I can insert extra writing space. Very useful tool. Yes, yes it does. Um, Okay. Does anyone notice something that's missing in this top toolbar or set of toolbars that we have here? Here's actually all the hidden icons. Does anyone see something that's missing that we normally would see in like Word? Not math type. Save. You don't see save at all. Why? Well, because OneNote automatically saves it as you're writing or typing. It takes a little get used to, to get used to. I know I'm one of those people who always wants to hit save all the time to make sure I don't lose anything. Uh, but you don't have to save. So that's, that can be very useful. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, it's saved as this. Tablet PC Seminar is one file that contains everything in it. By default, where, it's, where it goes right now is my notebook, which is in my documents. You can change that if you wanted to as well. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Well, let's say also, um, suppose I want to convert this writing to text, meaning actual type text. 
So let me, let me, oops, yep, okay. What I can do is right click on that gray part there and say convert handwriting to text. Now I didn't write this very ni neatly, so that go big red, that first one there is probably not going to work very well, but go big rot. <laughs> oh well. How about also you can search inside of your OneNote document both the typed text and the handwritten text. So let's say I want to search for the word go. Look what happens. It finds it. Think about how nice that could be if you were doing your, let's say if you're a student and you're writing up notes for a particular class. You could search through your handwriting with this mechanism. How accurate is the conversion from written text to type? Yeah, I mean, as you can see, it's a, if, if, if you write neatly, it will be fine. The conversion will be very good. I don't either. Uh, but you, you got at least one sense of how good it was, just from, from that. So, you know, you would have to write neatly if you want, want this to work very, very well. Um, I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't tried that yet. Um, okay, let's take a look at some examples of how I've actually used OneNote. As I was mentioning, um, OneNote is very, very useful to use if you're a student and you want to, um, let's say, take notes in a class. Let's say a professor just is writing on a chalkboard, dry erase board. You could use OneNote to take your notes. If the professor, let's say, gave you a Word document, well, you can take the notes in the Word document as well. In fact, I've had two past Stat 380 students actually use their tablet PCs to do that. But what you could do here as well is click on Insert, Document as Picture, and you can insert your Word document. There's also a way to get a PDF document in here as well. So maybe if your professor's distributing PDF documents, so you could do that. Now, obviously, since I'm not a student anymore, I don't have any good examples of students taking uh, uh, notes in class. But what I did do uh, earlier this semester with my STAT 380 students is I imported a Word document that contained my lecture notes for section 2.7, imported into OneNote, and I annotated uh, adding additional content to my lecture notes as we went along in that class. So for example, you see a big red square there when I was emphasizing what sums of squares total means. Also what I did though, I recorded the audio of my lecture. And I recorded the video of my lecture as well. So in the middle of the room, I had a tripod. I put the, depa the, the department's digital camera on top of it. And I selected record video. The great thing about that is that OneNote synchronizes the audio and the video to where you're making notes. So again, think of this if you're a student. You can record that lecture, the actual audio, and you can get to a certain part, part of that audio by going to that particular place in the notes, mouse over it, notice that little icon that we see there, that little film strip with a uh, speaker. Suppose I, I square and add them up over the select it, and, so and here the is the actual video. Let me make so this a little bigger. So this is the actual lecture. I just focused the camera on the projection screen. What you could do. Let me actually page down here. And suppose I come down here to where you see what's actually analysis of variance. Suppose I select that. And now the video fast forwards. You can see my actual writing that I'm doing. What we are doing is basically partitioning this asset. Okay. You get the point. You can see how useful that could be. Um, let's take a look at an another example, this time from my research. As many of you know, I do research, uh, I do some of my research with a person by the name of Josh Tebbs at the University of South Carolina. And the distance between uh, our, uh, us uh, at times can make it difficult to do research, especially if we are, let's say, putting a paper together, to, uh, putting a paper together. Um, now, Josh uses LaTeX. I don't use LaTeX. I just use Word. 
And, you know, unfortunately, LaTeX doesn't have as nice of editing tools, tracking tools when you're re editing and revising as Word does. So what Josh does is if he's taking the lead in writing a paper, he sends me the PDF document, um, and I import it into OneNote, and from there, I can make my edits, my changes to it. In instead of, let's say, snail mailing a printed copy back to him or even faxing something back to him, I do it this way. So, for example, I did not like the title of the paper, so I just typed in OneNote what I thought the title should be, and I wrote in there, you know, why. If I page down a little bit, you can see some of more my other edits as well. Um, so, for example, down here, I didn't like that paragraph. Deletions, I put in red. Comments, I write in green so you can see it better. Now, Josh doesn't have OneNote, unfortunately, on his computer yet. Um, so, in order for me to get this document then to him, I could save it as a PDF, but I will admit that conversion is not perfect. So, instead, what I do is I basically save it as a web page. File, save as, and come over here, save it as a .mht file, which can be read by a, like, Internet Explorer. I save mm -hmm. it that way, and email it to him. One last thing for OneNote. Let me close that out. You can actually share a OneNote file with someone simultaneously over the web. So, for example, maybe I'm talking to Josh on the phone and we're brainstorming about some research. Well, what I can do is the following. I say Tools, Shared Session, Start Shared Session, and let's start it. Move that out of the way. Notice how this turns to pink, meaning that now anybody on the Internet who knows the proper address, that IP address right there, can see this. And if they have OneNote, they can interact with it. So if Josh was had this file, he could write on it, I could see exactly what he's writing. So that can be a useful tool. Okay. Let's talk about podcasting, or more specifically, podcasting, and how a tablet PC can be used to enhance that. Uh, this semester, I've been experimenting with a software package called Camtasia Studio uh, in my class. And for about the last month, I've been recording my lecture. Now, when I record it, what, I'm, what I mean is I'm recording the audio and the video. Video meaning everything that you see on my computer screen goes into a video file. Well, what's an advantage of doing that? Well, since I'm using a tablet PC, all my notes are in Word. I can write on my tablet PC, so all the content that they're going to get from this lecture is written or typed already on my computer screen. The video file saves it and also puts in the audio as well. So let's take a look at an example. Again, this is done with Camtasia Studio. Let me also mention, uh, so sorry. Um, this was uh, chapter five in my regression analysis course where we're just learning about matrix algebra, we're doing a review for matrix algebra. And the way I begin every class is by showing them the scheduled web page of our course website to let us know where we are. Question and let's start that. Is, uh, next time, and we'll spend about the last half an hour of class reviewing for that. Uh, Project number two is due on Saturday, October 7th. Are there any questions before we get started? And let me just skip ahead here to section 5.2. Okay, so uh, we introduced what it made was uh, last time. Um, let's suppose we wanted to do some addition, or subtraction with matrices. Really simple. Suppose I have these two matrices here. If I want to add them, all I do is I add the corresponding <coughs> elements. So, um, so, for example, this zero here is adding one and negative one together. Let's fast forward to the test number one review. This is now in Windows Journal. And with any test that I give uh, students, 
I always have virtual office hours the night before the test. Meaning that you can go into the, the chat room for the course uh, and ask some questions to me. I'll be there uh, to, to answer them. And my virtual office hours will be Monday night on October 2nd from 7 to 8 p.m. So I can just skip ahead here. You can see how my test review is going just like that. Now what do I do with this? Well, after class, I get about a 40 or 50 meg file, upload it to the web server for students to download. So it's not exactly a podcast because they're not subscribing to it, but it allows my students to go back, review some stuff maybe that they missed the first time that they were in class. Maybe something wasn't clicking. Maybe they didn't understand it. Well, they can go back and see what was actually done in class. That's our question. Uh, the, the only thing that you should need, this, this in particular is Windows Media, and this, this uh, uh, what it looks like is it, not the best, this was one of my first times I tried this. Um, I've been using Flash Movie uh, recently, or I've been saving it as a Flash Movie, uh, so maybe Flash isn't, the most current version of Flash isn't installed on those computers. Uh, if you show me the, the computer after class, uh, after class, after the seminar, I'd be more than happy to take a look at it. Yep, yep, yep. It's just you download it to your computer, you can, and watch it from your computer whenever you want to. Um, so what are some advantages of doing this? Well, I mentioned about, you know, if students miss something during class. Distance education, you can distribute videos really easy of, of the course content. Also, uh, you can create additional instructional content to use outside of class. For example, I shot, you can say, a 10-minute video earlier this semester for my set 870 students just from my office illustrating how to work with our functions. And I just did it with my PC here. Um, a, another great benefit is that for instructors, suppose you're going to miss a class. Maybe you're going out of town. Well, you could have someone fill in for you. Or how about in your office, you just give the lecture itself, tape it, distribute it to your students. That is a possibility. Yeah. That, that's the cool thing is I don't need a camera for this. And let me stop that. Uh, I don't need a camera for this. And that, that's, that's really nice. But what if you do have a camera? Well, I've been experimenting with, a software, with some software called Breeze Meeting this semester. Just two weeks ago, I had a little short course over in ITG about Breeze Meeting. And what Breeze Meeting is is a video. It's for web conferencing. It allows you to share video, audio, and files simultaneously over the web. So anybody who's participating in this Breeze meeting can see exactly what's on my computer if I want them to. Also, if I had, let's say, a camera set up, they could see me as well. Um, if they have a camera set up at their place, I can see them as well. Let me show you an example. Oh, let, me, um, let me pause this. What I did here was, this was about a week ago in class, I uh, guess transmitted my lecture over this Breeze Meeting software. And back in my office, I used Camtasia Studio to record what a student would actually see if they were actually participating in Breeze Meeting. All they would need is the IP address, uh, breeze.unl.edu slash stat870 it was this day, and they could see this. Okay, are there questions? It's interesting okay, you see um, how much you use your hands when you talk, when you watch yourself. Let me fast forward here. It's about, it's about right there. Two binary variables. All that's going to happen is that you're going to have points here, 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 and here. Well, that's not a very easy thing. That's why you know, when you do have... The actual video that you could see... Um, if you're if you're at, if you were actually in breeze meeting at this time so was better. In this particular case, the well, through the compression, this distorts it a little bit. Compression model uh, to this data using y as a response, x as a predictor variable. Uh, here are my corresponding estimates of the betas. Okay, I think you get the point. Again, since I'm using my tablet PC, I can interact with what students are actually seeing. So where can this be useful? Well, let's say, for example, I'm teaching a class here. Let's call it bootstrapping at UNL. And I also want to teach it simultaneously with students at Kansas State. 
but we can all participate at exactly the same time through this breeze meeting. That would be one possible way to do it. Don't know if that's the best, but that's one possible way. Yeah, well you can you can see this with any computer, okay? It's just since I'm using a tablet PC, it allows me to write on the screen and add additional content. So Well, they don't actually need the software on their computer at all. We have what's a Breeze server. Okay. And all they need to do is go to the web address. Uh, I think it's a Flash, uh, I guess, Flash program itself. And you can get into it. But does it allow for students to, you know, distance learning students to ask questions in front of the class and simply uh, then sort of passively watching the, the lecture? And you give them either that moment or that moment. No. If they have a microphone, if they have a webcam, let's say, on their computer, they can participate fully. So. Uh, that, that's a great, great thing uh, ab about it. Um, let's see. Let me go back to the end. So, there's much, much, much more that I can tell you about tablet PCs. As Dave was mentioned earlier, my first time that I went through this, um, this seminar on Friday, uh, it actually lasted an hour and a half. And I've had to cut out a lot. So if you want to know more about tablet PCs, Please come talk to me. I could tell you a whole lot more about it. My corresponding website there, chrisbiller.com slash tabitpc, set up for the seminar. What will be located there, get some good links, but also a tape recording of the seminar using Camtasia Studio, I'm taping it right now, will be there. And so you can go back and view it. Okay, so that's the end of my talk. Are there any questions? Yes. Excuse me? How long does this take on the car? The computer itself? Mm -hmm. um, but just like a normal laptop battery. Uh, when I originally got my computer, I have two. I had two batteries in here. So it easily can last through class four or five hours. Um, now my computer is about three years old. Batteries decline over time. And so what I have now is an external battery that allows me a whole bunch more time. And that's what I'm running off right now. Yes. Can you do smoothing of uh, freehand drawers? So freehand drawers is the kind of major application for many people because it's difficult to use uh, the mouse separate from the studio for the drawer. And once you have done, you want to uh, have a nice uh, smooth of the I mean, you, you can do some very nice, I, very simple diagrams with this a lot easier than you could with a mouse. Uh, for example, let me see if I have one right handy. Uh, let's see. So this was something I cut out. I had this project uh, for my students where they were um, trying to model the number of students, I'm sorry, the number of cars stopped at an intersection, specifically I showed them 33rd and Holdridge, the number of cars that would be stopped there um, with a Poisson distribution. Would it work or not? And let me page you down. And so, for example, this is what 33rd and Holdridge used to look like before the uh, Quilt Study Center. But also, I did a little diagram. I don't know if this is what you're talking about, or maybe somewhat like it. I did a little diagram of the intersection to show them how to actually collect the data. So, you know, I don't know if you could do something really, really, really cool, let's say, in terms of, you know, uh, writing, uh, in terms of, let's say, painting or, or, or drawing or whatever. But... I could imagine that you could do some really, uh, really complex stuff. I haven't tried to. Are there other questions? Yeah. Yeah.